everybody. Uh, it seemed like that a few of you, if not quite a few of you, were interested to know in in how I got my life and how I got where I am. And I'm going to do my best, and I'm going to have to piece this together because I'm going to screw some of it up, forget some things I wanted to tell you and things, but I'll try and piece this together for you, and we'll try not to make it last all day. It's trying to give a biography of a lifetime, but that's not going to fit in here. Anyway, uh, when I was four years old, I was born in Warsaw, Indiana. When I was four years old, my dad got a job at Sandia in Albuquerque, Sandia Corporation. And he was a draftsman and project designer. And uh, he has a couple of patents on... Not patents, he has a couple of claims to having designed a few military things. Uh, one in particular was a trailer to be towed by a jeep, a military trailer. But uh, anyway, that's enough about that. But anyway, we moved to Albuquerque. We moved into a little tiny trailer that we were renting at the time. I believe we were renting it. And I remember as a little kid playing out on the little concrete in front of this trailer in a little trailer park. <coughs> I never knew that my dad was a model builder or anything, even way back until later in my years. But there was not much to do in that little trailer back then. You know, you had one or two TV channels and you were cramped in a little trailer and you just stared at each other. And it was an I Love Lucy kind of trailer, you know. I mean, it was pretty small. Anyways, um... One of the memories I had there, I have two memories there, and we'll start with this. One of the memories I had there was, it was at the corner of Wyoming and Central in New Mexico, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm sure none of you are familiar with that corner, but at that time, it's now in right in town, but at that time, it was the first stoplight on Route 66 in Albuquerque. And our trailer park was only a block off the street there, and I remember as a little kid laying in the bed in the back of the trailer there and hearing the Jake brakes on the truck. Brrr, all the way down to the stoplight. That was one of my memories of that time. But the to get going on, on my background is uh, because there was a lack of things to do when we were all home. Uh, this, my dad, I don't know. I don't know where my dad got it. I don't remember him buying it. But this was the first kit that my dad uh, helped me put together. Or he and I put together. And um, that's why I have that repro of that kit. Uh, I remember sitting hours, my dad gluing parts and me looking at it and me sitting on his lap and and let him allowing me to cut pieces off the sprues with all these sprues laid out and then when it was done I was just flabbergasted at wow all those little bitty pieces and it turned out to be this you know I don't know whatever happened to the model I'm 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 almost pretty sure that he probably took it to work or something and put it on his desk but God knows where it went from there but that was my, that was my, at four years old, that was my introduction to hobby, hobbies. Um, and actually, from that point forward, I don't really have vivid memories of, of uh, working on model kits or anything uh, until I was probably eight, nine, ten years old, maybe. We would go to Arizona where my cousin lives and still lives to this day. Everybody else is gone. But uh, he, the first thing he and I would do is our folks would, we either had money or whatever, they'd give us a dollar or a couple dollars or whatever, and they'd send us a couple blocks to a drugstore there. And we could get something to drink, we could get a candy, and we always went to the, to the model aisle. And uh, we would buy... Usually, my affinity for monster models came from that because my cousin 
was really into the whole monster movie thing and monster books, and he was a he was a real avid reader. He read hundreds of thousands of books, and I'm sure in his lifetime. But he even wrote when he was about twelve, maybe twelve or thirteen. He wrote, uh, tried to write an episode for Star Trek, which was new at the time, and he was just fanatical about it. I think it was Star Trek. Maybe it was some other show, but it, but anyway, for a show. And, of course, they got it. They appreciated him s sending it and all that, but they didn't. it never got done or anything. But that's the kind of guy he was. He was involved in the monster thing. So we'd buy monster models, bring them home, and we'd stick them together, and then we'd, you know, with each other and some soldiers and, you know, the whole kid thing the kids did. Well, you know, that back and forth going to Arizona just prompted me to do more and more stuff with models, you know, because we each tried to outdo each other. So anyway, and I don't know at, at what point in time, I would guess that I was beginning junior high school. I really got involved in in uh, building mo just any model, any model. Just it, it just occupied my time. I was an only child, so it occupied my only time when I didn't have buddies around or whatever. So I built cars, I built motorcycles, I built cars, I built motorcycles, I built cars, I built motorcycles. Not a lot of planes, not a lot of ships or anything, but cars and motorcycles were my deal. And, and I always had, an, had a vision in my head of becoming a automobile designer when I was young. And, uh, and I'll get into that just a little bit more. But... So I was building and modifying cars and motorcycles. And I would sit at my, I had a little corner desk that had two dressers coming out and it had that corner desk had a lot of room. So I had a lot of room to put a, a light with a, a bendable neck on it there and have all my paints and everything handy. And my mom and dad pretty much provided me with everything I needed to do that kind of stuff. Um, I could go to the store, pick out models. There was a place in Albuquerque in the mall there called Toys by Roy. They used to, that used to be my favorite place to go. They had a weekly model contest and I used to enter the weekly model contest occasionally. Uh, I always entered models in the New Mexico State Fair. I think you guys may have seen the video that I did quite some time ago about all the ribbons I have from the New Mexico State Fair. Um, I was quite involved in that uh, for, for some time. But just, I, I got to the point where I, I was obsessed with building models. And by the time I was in, well, getting close to the middle of high school, um, I had, I felt like at that particular time, I had felt like I had built about every model that of a car or a motorcycle that I wanted to build. So I started getting involved in doing dioramas instead. And um, so I was building dioramas and so forth. Uh, and if I might say so, I did some pretty nice ones. Uh, if any of you watch American Pickers, you may have seen a guy here in Las Cruces uh, by the name of Bob Duffy. He was a, he was a motorcycle stuntman. Only guy to ever jump a running helicopter. I think he's still in the book of uh, world records. Uh, I had a model of a Kawasaki motorcycle laying over on a turn that was on a diorama. And I, I uh, gave that to Bob. And if you watch the Pickers show and you watch really, really quick, you can see that model on a shelf. It's a green Kawasaki with a green, uh, green dress rider back when Kawasaki's were in green. And you can see it in the TV show. But anyways, um, and of course, then I got sidetracked into um, trying to struggle through high school. High school was not my uh, forte. And as it turns out, in today's world, I can, I, how should I say this? I can figure out why I didn't do well in high school. I was sent to many, many types of reading classes and schools, Evelyn Wood type schools, that kind of thing. Um, and I could just never get it. I just, reading was boring to me. Uh, it, it puts me to sleep. Um, and I'll explain that. In today's world, I have discovered that I likely have dyslexia. And I, I transpose numbers, I transpose words, I transpose everything. 
But I discovered that when I do read books, I'm constantly that I didn't discover back then. I read forward and then I think I missed something and I skip back and I reread and then I go a little bit further, skip back and I reread. So it would just take me eternities to read pages and things. But and it's kept me from doing a lot of, of reading. It's not that I can't read, it's just that it I I I I can't sit down and read a whole book. But that's neither here nor there either. But uh, anyway, I was, so I was horrible in school. I barely made it out of high school. Had no idea what I wanted to do. My dad, my dad, and my mom, neither one went to college. Uh, but my dad was an extremely good cartoonist back in the day, and he was an extremely good draftsman. And um, in fact, he was a cartoonist for his his um, high school uh, newspaper and I wish I had some of his artwork but that's a long story uh, that went away in when I got divorced the first time but anyways uh, <clears throat> he was an inspiration to me in the fact that he was very meticulous in what he drew I was very meticulous in what I built um, I could always work with my hands I, I always did work with my hands when I got out of school, I, you know, I was like most kids, like a deer in the headlight when I got out, and, and I had nothing to look forward to. So I wanted to be a car designer. Well, I found out that you got to be educated to be a car designer, and, and you can't just be a nobody, and you have to be very artistic. So that didn't work out. I couldn't, I wanted to be involved in cars. I didn't have the money for cars when I was younger, when I, even when I first start, started driving. So I, had, I got involved in motorcycles, and as you guys know, I raced motorcycles for about 10 years. I believe you, most of you know that. Uh, but what I did do is my dad said, well, what do you want to do? I mean, you know, you wanna, would you like to go to some type of trade school? Or, you, you know, what do you feel like? Did they ever push me towards college? Which I don't think I'd have made it through either. But I uh, somehow find, found out about Denver Automotive and Diesel College in Denver, Colorado. So uh, I asked my dad, would it be okay if I go to automotive school? He said, yes, I'll pay for automotive school. So that took place. I went to Denver, went to automotive school for a year. And while I was there, I worked at a place called Celebrity Sports Center, uh, which is obviously no longer there. But it was owned by Walt Disney. And downstairs in, in this humongous build, they had an Olympic swimming pool downstairs, and then they had a huge another place that was as big as an Olympic, Olympic swimming pool, and it had slot car tracks in it. I think there was four tracks in there, if I remember correctly. Every one of my paychecks, I went from upstairs, downstairs, spent all my paycheck money down there uh, buying slot car stuff. Uh, so I got involved in slot cars for a little while. Anyway, anyway got out of automotive school, and uh, when I got out of automotive school, I came back to Albuquerque and was immediately able to get a job at an American Motors dealership there. It was Key AMC. And uh, they made me a make ready, new car make ready. And um, AMC at that particular time was really in the beginnings of starting to have trouble. And, uh, but I worked for a guy by the name of Dick Poole. And it probably doesn't mean anything to anybody, but he was a pretty uh, well-known, at least in the Southwest, sprint car driver. And Dick kind of took me under his wing and uh, uh, put me on some cool stuff to do at the AMC dealer. And, of course, AMC was trying to get into the performance car market. They were latecomers, and they were trying to get into performance cars uh, right before all the emission control stuff. So I got to see all the AMC hot cars, 40, the, um, the newer body style AMXs with 401s. I got to see older AMXs with 390 or 360s and 390s. I got to see the, uh, the SC Rambler, which everybody called Scrambler, the little Rambler American with a hood scoop, Ram Air hood scoop, the, the Rebel Machine. Um, just everything, uh, the, the V8 Gremlin came out while I was working there. Uh, anyway, so I was kind of exposed to all that. So, but but uh, AMC was going under, and uh, I got a job offer at 
from a place down the street, which was a Lincoln Mercury dealer. I went down to work at the Lincoln Mercury dealer, and I was also a make ready there. And I had a, uh, I had some good bosses there. But I, what I found out was when you worked in a shop like that, you couldn't get the old guys to help you try and get on the mechanic side because they didn't want you taking their job away. It was it wasn't a union job, but it was a lot like that. They didn't want to teach you anything because they didn't want you taking their job. But it was okay because uh, in the new car make ready department, I would, because we had Lincoln's, Mercury's, and Pantera's at the time, uh, I got to take apart a lot of uh, doors. I got to take apart a lot of seats. I got to take do certain things to some engines. I didn't take apart engines, but I did certain things to some engines and things, um, which led me into the mechanical ability stuff. And I had a toolbox from when I went to school. Um, and I, for a brief time, uh, I think before I went to work for AMC, I worked at J.C. Penney's. Uh, that, was, that was a horrible experience. But uh, anyways, uh, my toolbox was stolen there. But I got a, they, they bought new toolboxes for the guys who got their boxes stolen. So I had a toolbox. Uh, but the, the coolest thing about working for Lincoln Mercury was the fact that they sold the Panteras. And two experiences I had there I'll share with you. Um, one of them was I got to drive, I don't know, maybe 20 Panteras while I was there. And it, uh, uh, if you don't know what a Pantera is, you can look them up on the computer. But a Pantera was a uh, American engine, 351, in, in a Italian-built bodied car. And a uh, five-speed transaxle. I think it was a five-speed. might have been a four-speed transaxle. I don't remember. I think it was a five-speed. But they were about as close to a Ford GT40 as you could get. So uh, I was in hog heaven there. A um, lot of stories there. But we'll, we'll save the stories for another video. But we'll move forward in my life here because we don't want this to go on forever. Uh, anyway, I was working at the Lincoln Mercury dealer. Somebody came in and... and for some reason, somebody came in and said, hey, I, I saw where the telephone company's hiring. Uh, maybe you ought to go down and check it out. Well, I decided that would be a good idea. It's a nice steady job and probably more room for advancement than at doing automotive work. So I went down there and uh, I'll share my, my uh, experience of getting hired. I stood in line with about 100 people and we we're waiting to get into the building and I finally get up there to get in the building because we all were waiting outside the building and this woman walked me down the hall and walked me and said go into that office right there and speak to the lady in there I walked in the office it was a very nice looking black woman that was there and she was looking down at some paperwork and uh, never looked up at me didn't she she had no idea what I looked like nothing I don't she never looked up at me she was looking down at my paperwork. She said, are you Pfeiffer? I said, yes. She said, uh, do you think you can use a shovel? And I said, yes, I think I can. And she said, well, you start on Monday. And that was my hiring process for the telephone company. So anyway, I went to work for a telephone company, did numerous jobs at the telephone company, and was always busy there, so kind of fell out of the modeling thing. But along the way... I got some jobs working at a couple of hobby stores. And to backpedal just a little bit, when I, when I was in junior high school and I lived down in the valley in Albuquerque, the North Valley, there was a hobby shop right on the way home from junior high school. And I can't for the life of me remember the name of the place, but it was, it was two stories. It was an upper floor that was on ground level and a basement. Always had planes hanging. I always went in there and drooled all over everything. And that, that, was, that kept fueling my... Uh, building of models and while during that time period and I know I'm backpedaling here but during that time period my, my mom never hardly ever bought me anything um, that's a long story too but her and I never got along very well but <clears throat> I was sick one time and I guess she felt bad for me so she went into town, I was sick at home, and I'd been sick for a couple of days, and she brought me this, this model. Now this is a, 
this is an original release. The, the model I got was exactly this, not this one, but exactly this model. And so I bought this so I would have this in memory of, of that being the only model she ever bought me. And I, as you guys may or may not know as well, I have it built. I have the Lindbergh version of that built because it was reissued by Lindbergh up on the shelf up there. But that was one of the cool parts of, uh, of when I was younger. But anyway, I had seen this hobby shop all the time on the way home from junior high school. And I would dr go in there literally, if I didn't ride the bus, I would go in there literally every day and look at the airplanes and look at the models and look at all the things that people had built in the cases and all that stuff. And I was just amazed. So I, excuse me, I, my mom let me get a, my mom and dad, let me get a, a subscription to Car Model Magazine. And Car Model was a big model car magazine back in the day. It is no longer produced, obviously. And, and copies of it now sell for 6 to 12 bucks a piece, depending on which one it is. But it, it, I just was absorbed in it. And I used to look at them and look at the pictures of the work people did and all this stuff. And it just... it. it, it it influenced me when I was in this building process when I was in junior high school. But anyway, let's let's go back forward again. Uh, and then I got to the phone company, and um, some interesting things happened. Uh, I, I they hired all these people. Then they decided they hired too many people, and they were going to lay a bunch of people off. Okay, we had been there three months or so, and they told me. Uh, my boss, my, I was on a line crew with a bunch of guys who were old, crusty guys. And here's this little young punk kid that's really small, weighs about 98 pounds wet. Um, and they just never thought I could do the work. They never thought I could do anything. So they never gave me a chance to do anything. But I hung in. And my boss, or the boss of that line crew, hated my guts. Why, I don't know, but he just... I must have looked like somebody he never didn't like in a past life. But uh, so they said, well, if, if uh, they're, they're hiring or they're allowing people to take jobs in Houston, Texas, uh, they need some help down in Houston, Texas, reclaiming cable and stuff, but they're only, they only need uh, cable splicers. So my boss hated me so much, he told them I was not a lineman, I was a cable splicer, and they sent me to Houston, Texas. Uh, I worked with a guy down there. For about three months, I bought a I bought a cheap old car when we got down there because we had to drive company trucks down there, and everybody there was all of us used that car. Uh, but anyways, uh, then they found out I wasn't a uh, cable splicer and sent me back to Albuquerque. From Albuquerque, they said if you want a job with the phone company, you're going to Farmington, New Mexico. Well, I went to Farmington, New Mexico. I worked up there. No, nope, it's it was a lot like the automotive thing. Nobody would teach me anything, so. Uh, the boss up there took me under his wing, um, and uh, he he basically the guys would go out during the day, and then he'd tell me to stay, and then he'd take me out in a I would take my truck, he'd take his truck, and we'd go out to a splicing job, and he would literally sit down and showed me how to read the blueprints and how to uh, splice cable and how to hold the tools, you know. Um, holding your scissors and your tool in one hand and then, you know, snipping the wires and then getting the tool and putting the connectors on. And, and it, was, it was quite interesting to me because it involved my hands. Anyway, that led to me staying with the phone company for umpteen million years. In, 19, in 1985, we went to a meeting in Albuquerque and I had been... Uh, married to my first wife, had a daughter who I no longer have contact with, and divorced, and that was a long thing. Won't bore you with that. Uh, and then when I got back to Albuquerque, I met Robin, and uh, we got married. But in 1985, <clears throat> we went to a meeting in a, in a big meeting room at the telephone office there, and uh, the telephone yard that I worked out of which was called Bogan Warehouse. Um, they had a big meeting, and there was about 50, probably 50 to 60 people in this big meeting room, and then, of course the big wigs were there, and they had a, said we have a, an announcement and a request. So we're all there, and we're listening to the all the spiel, you know, about how good everybody's doing, and the ones who are not doing, and, and so forth. And then they said, 
uh, we're, we're getting ready to do something revolutionary and we're, we're looking for volunteers. Well, of course, every we've heard that before in the business. So we look at each other and we're kind of, everybody's kind of, ooh, 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 you know. So um, they said, we're going to get in the business of fiber optics. And none of us really understood or knew much about fiber optics other than it was a way to transmit signals through glass tube. <coughs> I was sitting somewhere in the middle of this room and I looked around and, oh, well, let me get back to the story. They said, we're going to get into fiber optics. And what we're looking to do is form a unlocated line crew and splicing crew that will travel up and down New Mexico, placing fiber optic cable from one end of New Mexico to the other. And you will probably be on the road for two to three years. Well, I had, Robert and I were married at the time, but, um, like all young people, we needed money. We had just bought a house. Um, so I said, I, I looked around the room and nobody was raising their hand. And all of a sudden I looked way back in the corner and there was a big old guy that I had, a splicer that I had been working with for some time. And uh, he raised his hand and I looked at him and I said, well, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. And I raised my hand and then they asked about uh, the line crew guys and about four or five line crew guys raised their hand because they were all kind of rowdy hell raisers and, you know, we can get out on the road and we can go to the bars and you know how that goes. Well, maybe you don't, but that's how it was back in the day. Um, but anyway, so we volunteered for that and I got into fiber optics in 85 and I retired in 2005 and I had spliced fiber optics for, um, geez, let's see. 15 to 20 years, and um, then I, I, I spent out the rest of my career at the telephone company working in air pressure. They pressurize underground cables to keep water out, um, and I worked with another guy uh, doing that for my remain the remainder of the time at the phone company. Um, I got into a labor dispute with my union members, first one in 32 years, which wound up being a fiasco. We'll tell that story another day. But what led me to actually resign or retire, I had 32 years, two years more than you needed to retire. They put GPS on our trucks, which was no big deal. We all knew our jobs, we all did our jobs and it was no problem. But they had reduced the company speed to 65 miles an hour and the speed limit on the national highways at that time was 75. We had cell phones at the time, and I, my partner and I were driving to Silver City, New Mexico in a phone truck with no cruise control and a 460 engine in it. And my phone rang, and no cruise control, by the way. They wouldn't spend money on a, if they came, if the truck came with toothpicks and it was two cents extra, they wouldn't buy the toothpicks. Um, but, but, but anyway, no cruise control or nothing. I'm, and I, we're driving along, change legs here on you for a minute. And, um, so my, my partner and I, I, we looked at each other. He, she, we were talking. I pull out my phone, flip phone. I open it up. This little voice on the other end says, little girl from, uh, Denver, Colorado told me she was from the whatever desk up there. She says, she says, I noticed that you've been exceeding the company speed limit by four miles an hour for the last 10 miles. And I said, okay. And I was exceeding it, I don't know how many miles an hour, I was exceeding it to four, four, more, four or five miles an hour, something. But anyways, she said, well, you do realize, don't you, that I'm going to have to report that to your foreman and it will go in your record. And I said, um, I, I, I think I realize that. And I said, would you do me a favor when you call him and pass that on to him? Would you also ask him to get my retirement papers out? And she laughed. Well, when I got back that day, my foreman tells me, he says, I gotta put this in your record. They're gonna make me put this in your record and I have to talk to you and I know it's a bunch of baloney and all this crap. And I said, that's okay, you can put it in the record. And I said, by the way, did you get my retirement paper out? And he started laughing. And I said, I'm not kidding. I want my retirement paper and I want it right now. I took the retirement paper, I filled it out and brought it back the next day. 
And about a week later, vamonos amigos. Um, but I just wasn't going to have the irony of this, and I will, I, I know this is not model related, and but it's, it's my life. But um, what was ironic about that was I was on a fiber optic restoration crew all my life, all my career because of fi being a fiber splicer. But if they called you at 2 o'clock in the morning and said, we have a cut fiber in Carrizozo, New Mexico, you know, maybe 100 and, 100 and something miles from here, it was okay for you to drive 60 mile an hour through town down to the yard, pick up a fiber optic trailer with a van and a van, and then go 90 miles an hour or over all the way to Carrizozo because they'd be calling you every five minutes to ask you, uh, what is your estimated time of restoral? To which my answer, because I, I'm a smart aleck, was always five minutes sooner if you let me off this phone. So anyway, to get to the point of that, um, that was the irony of it. When you were when when they needed you to be to be someplace quickly, you could exceed any speed limit there was, and they didn't care. But if you exceeded it by four miles an hour, if you were going someplace on a regular uh, trouble ticket or uh, your job function, uh, they'd call you and they'd put it in your record. So I just had it up to here. So anyways, after that. My boss lost his job at the phone company due to an incident at White Sands Missile Range that was uh, that took it way longer than expected. It was a fiber optic cut, only because the uh, military base was not willing to share their record documents uh, on where the fiber optic cables were placed there, and we had no idea where it was cut. But anyways, to get to the crux of that was they held him responsible for that, even though it wasn't our response. He got he left the company, and immediately turned around and talked to some of his cronies that he knew from White Sands out there and got a job with a contractor and then immediately referred me to the contractor to go out there and splice. So I spent another six years splicing fiber optics and doing work on White Sands Missile Range. So uh, a total of 38 years in the telephone business. Well, right before I had retired from the telephone company, uh, well, I shouldn't say right before, but about three or four years, maybe more than that, before I retired from the telephone company, I had a buddy that was doing model trains. And I had gotten into the train business when I was in, not train business, I had gotten into model trains when I was in Albuquerque. I went to the mall and there was a modular layout set up there. And I talked to the guys and I said, man, this looks cool. I, I've built, been building plastic models and, pla and dioramas. And I said, the cool part about this is you can build a diorama, you can build the model train, you can run the model train, and you you have all these facets that you can do, and you can run it, and it doesn't get broken like a plastic model. I said, this is kind of cool. Anyway, I got started in that club, Doña Ana Modular, I mean, I'm sorry, it was, um, oh, it won't come to me now, the Albuquerque group, but Nevertheless, I joined their group. I built some modules. I was up there. They were really happy, and, and I had a good time doing that and setting up at the malls and talking to people and uh, running the trains there and so forth. As a matter of fact, right in front of the toy store, I had bought models at as a kid all along. It was just exciting for me. So I got into model model business uh, quite some, some time before I retired from the phone company. A about three or four years, maybe five years, it could have been up to five years, um, a buddy and I that were in the tr doing trains after we had moved down here to Las Cruces, um, we decided to pool some money together and see if we could open a model train store, which we did. We both pooled some money together. We bought uh, a, a storefront, and it just so happened that there, there was a hobby store here and the man had Parkinson's disease and he had just passed away, unfortunately. And we went to his shop and approached his wife about selling part of the inventory of the store. We bought that. We started our own little, our own little shop and uh, we did pretty well at it for a little while, although I was still working at the phone company. So this went on for a little bit. Uh, I didn't have uh, the, uh, the time to put into it because I was working at the phone company. And uh, so I sold my half to him. Um, 
I had worked for a man named Charlie McDaniels in, in Albuquerque at a place called Duke City Hobbies, and he, it, this was long before this, and he had, he had tuned me in to uh, how to deal with distributors, how to buy, how he worked his business and all that. His, his motto or his theory of running a model, model business, and he, had, he has a full service hobby shop, everything, planes, cars, boats, every, you name dollhouses, you, he had it framing pictures. He had uh, everything. Uh, his approach was to never buy anything outright, to buy it on uh, 30, 60, or 90 days and then hope that you could sell it before you had to pay for it. Um, I, I never did prescribe to that theory. I don't like it very much. But nevertheless, he taught me a lot about the hobby business. Now, fast forwarding, we did our own hobby business and we purchased our things outright. I think we did buy some things on credit and it did kind of work out. But anyway, uh, my partner, I sold my half to him because I couldn't devote enough time to the business. He was really energetic about growing it into more stuff, such as RC stuff. And uh, so I sold my half to him. Uh, it was called Rio Grande Hobbies. And uh, uh, he ran it, after I left, he ran it for about another three years, maybe two or three years. And his dad passed away and left him a bunch of money. And at that point, when he was left the money... He was divorced and he had some boys and he had been in some trouble, serious trouble. Um, and I won't go into that. But uh, he basically, once he got the money from his dad, he kind of let the shop go into the ground. So that was kind of the end of our, our uh, my, him, he and I's exploit into a retail shop. But in 2004, a year before I was going to retire from the phone company, I, I kept telling Rob, and I said, my dream all along has been to own a hobby shop. And I said, I, uh, I realized that there's too much. It, it was the beginning of the Internet, the very beginning of the Internet, and, and businesses going online. And um, it was already hurting people. Uh, especially hobby businesses, and, and, you know, things with things that required discretionary funds. So uh, I kept telling Robin, I'd still like to do a hobby shop. I'd like to do a business, but I wonder if we could do it online. Everything's going online. I wonder if we could do that. Well, I started talking to people that I trusted and, and so forth, and they all told me, oh, you'll, you'll never be able to do that. You, you can't do it. And I said, you'll never, you will never get a wholesaler to sell to you because wholesalers didn't want the hobby stores to evaporate because they were unsure of the Internet. So through several months of uh, trying to contact wholesalers through the, with the help of friends I had in the hobby business, I finally got a wholesaler to sell to us. And um, we started in a closet in our house. We had our, all of our inventory in a small closet in the house, created a website, and uh, the first website, and... Um, we started selling stuff. And then we started, when we sold stuff, we had to order stuff. And when we started ordering stuff, the people that we were buying from at the time realized that we weren't buying on 30, 60, 90 days. They, we were paying cash. Well, not cash, but we were, we were writing checks and basically paying cash and paying for our orders as we ordered. Well, when they realized that and all these other hobby retailers were working on 30, 60, 90 days so they didn't have to use their cash, they started to love us. And when they started to love us, we got other people, other distributors that called us and said, hey, we'd like to do business with you. Okay. This one had called. I'd like to do business with you. Okay. You know, what do you sell? So we, we grew our business over a period of uh, a year or two, three, four maybe, um, a little bit, just a little bit, because I was still working out at White Sands after the retirement. So I didn't have a lot of time there again to grow the internet business, but it was bringing in more and more money and we were having more and more inventory to the point that we had to build a small shed. We went into the shed, which is the one that sits in front of this shed. And uh, we moved the inventory from inside the house, outside. Um, 
at some point along the way, I don't know when we when we created the new website, um, we were we actually were buying. Uh, we couldn't get in with micro trains, and micro trains was the big deal when you were going to do strictly N scale, which we had always had in our head. Um, so I, we were buying uh, our N our micro trains cars from a guy in Nevada who would buy them at cost and then charge us 10% and then we would pay 10% over cost and then we would buy, we would sell them at under, under retail, but you know, at some percentage. And that was working out okay, other than I was having to depend on him to submit my order to him, him to order them and ship them to me. And that was kind of a fiasco. And, um, but anyway, the more people had told me I couldn't do it, the more we tried to do it. So that that was the point of that. And then finally, uh, after bugging and bugging and bugging a lot of these places who wouldn't sell to anything but a brick and mortar store, I was writing or calling uh, microtrains about once a month. And finally, I think microtrains finally realized that, hey, um, a lot of hobby shops are closing and a lot of things are going online and it's affecting our business. So they had come out with some stipulations. You could buy if you were, you were a, a little online shop, but it, there was some concern there whether you were actually a legitimate business or you were buying them for your own layout and you were getting a business license to say you were a business and you weren't really a business. You were a Joe Blow buying stuff for your layout. That's what they were trying to differentiate. So they came out and said, if you place an initial order of over $5,000, we will consider that a confirmation of the fact that you are seriously in the model railroad business or the model business, model railroad business. So we did that. We placed a $5,000 initial order and we got hooked up with them and we've been buying micro trains and for the last, let's see, I'm trying to think how many we have in there. I think there's eight, nine, 10, 11. There's at least 11 or 12 plaques in there. We've been a top 20 micro train dealer for that many years. Um, and uh, th they pretty much know we pay our bills and you know we do what we need to do. Um, so that being said, I'm gonna take a short break here, get a drink of water and we'll pick this right back up. Okay gang, I'm back. Uh, so without Dre, I'm gonna. I'm just. I know this is a long video, but um, anyway. Um, so we grew and grew the business as we could while I was working. Uh, then Obama put a stop to the contractors on White Sands Missile Range. Uh, we. I lost my job at White Sands. Fortunately, Robin had making been making double payments on everything because I was making quite a bit of money working for the government, and. Um, when I when the prospect of losing the job at White Sands came along and she had been paying off these bills, we got to thinking, well, we really don't need a whole lot more money. So I don't know whether it's equitable for me to try and find another job and so forth. <clears throat> so we just took a bunch of money we had, we put it into the business, even grew the business more. We started buying, we even started buying these little guys stuff that we're making it out of their house and things. And you, you guys know we've had some crazy things over a period of time. Some of them nice things, some of them not so much. Um, but a lot of these guys uh, make some good stuff, have made some good stuff, and a lot of these guys have passed away. Uh, a lot of the uh, whole, the guys who are our contacts in the, in the wholesale business have passed away. Uh, and we have new guys and new people coming in all the time. And... Um, Somewhere along that line is when my, my son, my son, our son, uh, he's my stepson, but our son got a job at the city of Las Cruces and he worked for the Convention and Visitors Bureau and he was in charge of doing all their internet work, taking photographs because he, he graduated in journalism. So anyway, they, they put him in there taking care of all the internet based stuff with the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Visitors Bureau. Uh, he has since moved way up the ladder, but we will we'll get to that, or we won't get to that, it won't matter. But that connection uh, gave me a person within the family that knew more, way more about the people to contact as far as uh, 
taking care of your internet business, building your building an internet business, and its relationship with Google search engines and all of that stuff. So getting my son involved in helping me create the new new website, telling me what we did and need, did and didn't need to do, uh, getting a guy that he knew through the city to join our cause as well and advise us on um, what to do to get noticed out there on the internet and so forth. And by the way, he's he's uh, still our guy. He's in North Carolina right now, now. but anyway, uh, he still helps us. Um, we we decided to take that money, grow the business, and then with my son's involvement in, in the internet and being able to teach me more about the internet and help us with more about the internet, uh, we branched out, uh, not branched out, but uh, blossomed into an internet company that we are today. Uh, we're still a very small business. Robin is the actual owner of the business. Um, we have never, uh, this is probably the craziest thing that most people won't believe. We have never borrowed a dime to build this business. Not a dime. Uh, we didn't even borrow money when we built this shed to build this train layout in. So, uh, it's done good to us. Uh, I won't go into our specific financial stuff. But along the way, I met a lot. Of, I have met a lot of nice people, uh, guys that were my close friends. I have started two different clubs. I started an HO modular club when I came down here to Las Cruces, and we used to set up at the malls and things up here until they started putting kiosks in the mall. At which point, the kiosk people got mad because we were there for free and they had to pay, but we weren't selling anything. Uh, but the mall said, "You guys got to go." So that was kind of the end of that. Uh, I got involved in the HO club, permanent club, when I came down here uh, through the <laughs> through going to coffee in the mornings at the phone company. I was able to meet a, a, a gentleman down here uh, who had a small, what you would like a hometown convention center. It was basically a big barn kind of thing, and they had dances, they had sales, they had gun shows, they had this show, they had that show, they had proms, they had... Everything under the sun they did. Dickerson. Charlie Dickerson was his name, and it was Dickerson's barn. And the family's still here. But nevertheless, um, we sat down one morning, and Charlie happened to be sitting at the table. And he was, at the time, a, uh, in charge of the, of the fair board at the fairgrounds out here. And I told him, well, we're losing all this. We're losing being able to take the modules to the mall and stuff, and we'd like to start a an HO club, and we already had an HO club in town, but they they were getting ready to, tear, the Santa Fe was getting ready to tear down the building we were in, which was a water treatment building that we were paying a dollar a year rent on um, because of the, um, all the train mergers were taking place. Anyway, they were going to tear the building down, so we were going to have to move. Well, we weren't going to have to move because I think they would have tolerated us for another 20 years, but, but uh, nevertheless... We wanted to move. We had outgrown it. The layout was a gazillion years old. I think that club was started in 1961 or 62. Anyways, I was talking to Charlie that morning, and I said, Charlie, I said, uh, where well, the club wants to move, the HO club wants to move, uh, do you know if they're using all those buildings out at the fairgrounds? Because there's a bunch of Quonset huts out there. And you guys, I think, may know that we have a, the N-Scale club has one of those Quonset huts now. He said, yeah, he says, we, you know, we have less and less stuff going on because they used to have the model contests were in, the, in those buildings, the flower contests were in those buildings, that kind of stuff, but they had a bunch of empty ones. And I said, well, is there one out there that's empty that we could actually start a club out there and build a permanent layout in? He said, oh, man, we'd love to have something to be a draw to the fair and everything. So anyway, that wound up being a long-term thing, and that was the HO group, and we built an HO layout out there, and there is only one of those guys left alive. And I'll give you one guess who that is. Um, that building is still there. There's a man, his wife, and their child who are trying. They, they want them out of there because they're tearing those particular ones down. Those were there when that was a radar training station during World War II. Uh, they're trying to get those removed. Then there's the three that 
the three quant sets that are next to each other out there where we are now as the N scale group. And they're trying to get the HO, those three HO people that are left to move over to that building, and I don't see anything happening there. So I'm not sure what's happening with the HO group. But somewhere along that line, I had asked the county who owns the property out there if the model, if the N scale people could have one of the buildings and model N scale. And so they allowed us to use the building that we have out there now. And we've been out there, I think, 11, I think this is our 12th year, actually. So we've been there quite some time with the N scale layout. And obviously, I'm still involved in models and building models, uh, hobbies. Uh, I've had some conversations with some of you guys uh, on here that, um, in fact, one recently, and I can't remember the member, but it, it's uh, not important. But I think we all have the same feeling. Uh, he said he was still a kid at heart, and I said, I am too. I said, I'm just like you. Uh, my priority in going to any kind of a department store or anything in today's world is to go to the toy aisle first. Um, I don't know, I never got it out of my system. Um, and uh, that being said, I'm just gonna wrap this up by saying saying that uh, that's how I got to the hobby business where I am and all the building of models and all the things that I do hobby related and so forth. My dad was a civil, by the way, my dad was a civil war collector and we always went out camping and everywhere we camped was a, an old civil war fort. And this was before they put a stop to digging up uh, Civil War relics and being able to uh, sift for them, dig them up, and keep them. My dad had a fortune of that stuff, which my mother immediately sold upon his passing without giving me a chance to have any of that. But that's beside the point as well. Um, but uh, the fairgrounds has been real nice to us out there, and I, what I was leading into is my fascination with the cars. As I told you before, when I was younger, I couldn't afford a car, so I raced motorcycles, which is something I could barely afford, but I did. So, as you guys know from watching the videos on Lisa, my Mustang, for those of you who haven't, um, at 60 years, 68 years old, uh, Rob and I went to look at a car that I was just going to work on. I had fixed up a couple of cars during COVID and sold and for something to do. And uh, I was going to look at a little Astro van because I knew I could put a V8 engine in it. And uh, she said, you're not going to buy that van, are you? And I said, well, yeah, that was kind of my plan. I was going to buy that and make my hot rod out of it that I've never had. And she said, no, not a van. Whatever happened to that Mustang you were like? I said, Consequently, we went to a place called Picacho Hills up here where the guy had it for sale. We drove it. We drove. She's never been a car person. And when she got, when we were driving in it and got out of it, she had a big smile on her face. And I knew she was kind of hooked on the car. Uh, we stood there and talked to the guy for quite some time. And she finally looked at me and said, and I'm standing there because I know I don't have enough money for the car. I was about $3,000 short. And uh, she said, well, what are you going to do? Uh, and I, I look at her, and she's the money manager. She's always been the money manager, and a damn good one, by the way. And that's uh, the best comment I can give to her is she's, she's been a rock of a money manager. I'm a money spender. She's a money manager. And uh, she's, she's actually the one that's created the funds to do all of, all of this, everything that I've ever had in my life. But um, anyway... Uh, she looked at me and she said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, what do you mean? What am I going to do? I don't have enough money. She says, well, I'll give you the rest of the money. Do you want the car? And I said, heck yeah, I want the car. So we made the deal with the guy and that started the story of Lisa. And that's why I'm so fond of the car and the car's name is Lisa. The car is named Lisa because Robin's middle name is Lisa and her grandmother's first name was Lisa. So that just was one of the things that came to my head, and I said, in honor of those two people whom I both loved, both of them, both of her grandparents. I loved all my grandparents and my dad and everybody, don't get me wrong. My mom was a little bit different story. She was a very um, mean person, but we won't go there. I can't, I could, uh, you guys would be astounded at the things that she did when my father was sick. But, but um, anyway, um, 
so that the car holds has a story to me. It belongs to me. It feels like it's part of the family. I look at hot rods all the time, and I wish I could buy them. I wish I had the money to buy another one and had a place to put it. I have the money to buy it. I don't have a place to put it. But anyway, that led us to where we are today, where I have my layout. I can make the videos. The videos all started out, by the way, by just trying to document me creating. Uh, I did the videos for me, not for anybody else. And really, that's kind of what YouTube was in the beginning. Now YouTube has evolved into a business and money making proposition. Um, I haven't gone there. I don't. I don't. I have never charged people for my videos. I've never. Um, I make some money off of the advertising. I monetize them all. Let people advertise on them, and we make just a tiny bit of money off of that. But but uh, it's not nearly what you would think it is. But. Uh, that's why I do it. Now I do it just because I've developed so many of you friends on here uh, and, and customers and things. And, and we do get customers from the YouTube videos. Uh, but to this day, it amazes me some, sometimes when we go someplace that's not here, in, in Las, even here in Las Cruces, but other places, Albuquerque or some of the train conventions that we've been to, and even some of the campgrounds that we've gone to, people recognize me from my YouTube videos. And I just, they call me a movie star or whatever. I'm no movie star. I'm, I'm, no, I'm nothing like that. I, 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 I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy who has loved the hobbies all, all my life, loved hobbies in general, and loves sharing what I do, and loves sharing what I do amongst other people who do what I do. Um, I would have a model model club here, a plastic model club here, if I had the time to organize it and run it, but I don't, and I just, I don't know any of the guys that do it here well enough to do that, but um, I think the model industry is coming back, I think kids are getting into it because they're making some models that are easier to put together, models with the product inside to build the model, and that, that kind of stuff, but uh, we don't need to go there, you guys know what it is. And I want to say, the last thing I want to say before I wrap this up is if you guys have a question about any of my history or anything you want to know, uh, ask me and I'll probably tell you. But I just want you guys to know that um, contrary to what people would have you believe about this hobby back here, this hobby up here, um, RC planes, any hobby, RC cars, drones, anything. Uh, it's not It's not going away. It's really not going away. It seems like it's going away to us that are getting older because we don't see a lot of older guys in it and we don't attract younger people. But younger people and their fa mothers and fathers and their grandparents still have to buy product if they're into it. So we do get to see people of all ages actually buying or their parents buying or their grandparents buying stuff to help these kids get into it. And we have two young members at our, our uh, club uh, with two fathers that are relatively active in the club. One in particular is, is extremely active. Uh, and the kids are real nice, real good. Uh, we, we have a, a grandmother that brings a, a young guy in they haven't, he has not joined the club yet, the, the boy, but he does come in, and when he comes in, we turn him loose with the throttle, and, and off he goes, and he does pretty well. Uh, so there are young people into it, there are young people interested in it, and above all, you would be very surprised how many women are in it. Um, we have, uh, it's not a huge percentage, but we have a pretty good percentage of women that are in it. And I would say we have as many women in it as we have uh, young people, I mean really young people in it. Uh, we have a, an extremely large amount of middle-aged people in it now, but there's a huge amount of, of us old folks in it. But that spark, that ember is still down there at the bottom of the age level. Uh, I just want you guys to know that I think it's um, it's still alive. I think it's still going to be alive, all of these hobbies. And I think the more that um, the younger generation in today's world get tired of the Internet, I, I think that you can only do so much on the Internet and with video games and things until you burn out. And I think you'll see 
I think you'll see retail shopping come back. I think you'll see malls come back at some point. It, we may all be gone, and everybody's going, ooh, ooh, right now, I know. But I think all these things are going to come back because they will become novelties. It will be novel to get in your car or get into your, get on your electric bike, get onto your whatever you get onto at that time, your hovercraft, I don't know, whatever it winds up being, and going to a physical location to look for something specific that you're looking for as opposed to the impersonal typing of keys on a keyboard. And believe me, we have an internet shop and I don't like it any more than you guys do. If I thought I could afford uh, to have a retail shop and had the time to do it and, and I wasn't retired, um, I would get into a hobby business in a heartbeat again. But when you live in a town such as I do with 100,000 people or more and probably another 50 to 75,000 people in the outlying area and you're only uh, 45 minutes from uh, two cities of which have almost a million people in it on our side and, and a million and a half on the other side of the border and we can only muster up 10 members in our club, uh, there's not a huge... When you don't have a huge population base that has the background of what we do, um, you would have a hard time making it in a store. A store would be much easier back east uh, where trains are prevalent still today and people see trains every day and people have been exposed to trains all their life. But anyway, that's enough of my philosophy and that's kind of my uh, what is extended into a long biography. But... Um, as I always say, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it gave you some kind of information on how I got from point A to point Z. Not Z, but I'm at point X. But anyways, um, that's it for me. That's how I got where I am. That's kind of what I've done all my life. And um, there's a lot of really small stuff that I omitted from this. And you can see that it turned out long enough already. So, uh, and I'm not going to edit any of this, so you guys are just going to have to watch a long video or you're not going to watch it at all. So, I appreciate you and thanks for watching.